If there's someone in your life today and you're having a real difficult time forgiving that person, one of two things is true about you. Either you've never really experienced the forgiveness that you get through Jesus Christ or you really don't understand it. Because forgiven people are forgiving people. You forgive because you are forgiven. And you are forgiven because Christ died and was raised from the dead. Here's what I want to tell you today. I'm going to say it the same way in a different fashion over the next four weeks. You ready? Here's the good news. You can lose your baggage. I don't care how heavy your baggage is. I don't care how long you've been carrying it around. I don't care how strong you think it's attached to you. You can lose your baggage. And I know some of you are thinking, heard this before, I absolutely can't do it. After this, after the 930 service, I had a lady come up to me and I, would, I can't even tell you what she told me. It wouldn't even, I couldn't even speak of it in this building. And with tears in her eyes, she said, I need to lose my baggage. I just don't know how to do it. Even after your message, I'm really struggling. And I have to admit, it is heavy, heavy baggage. And you may sit there and say, well, how do you know I can lose my baggage? I don't even know what my baggage is. I know it because of something a man wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. If you brought a copy of God's Word, I want you to turn to the book of Ephesians. It's a book about halfway down the, in, in the New Testament. It's about eight or nine books past the book, the, the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, chapter 4. We're going to look at two little verses, powerful verses. Verses I'm convinced if people inside the church and outside the church started obeying these two verses, you would see an incredible transformation in relationships, marital, political, national, and international. It would be staggering. Here's what Paul begins by saying, Ephesians 4, 31. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. Now, listen to what I love. I love the way this translation renders what Paul said. Because Paul simply says this. Now, what, listen to what he says. He comes to you and he comes to me and he says, um, you got any bitterness toward anybody? Is there anybody that really did you wrong and you still hold a grudge against them? Well, yeah, as a matter of fact, there is. Okay, get rid of it. That's it. That's it. Get rid of it. Oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> you still mad? You still ticked off at somebody because they really messed you over? Yeah, I really am. Stop it. Well, that, that helps. Do you still find yourself, now be honest, do you feel st still find yourself maybe at night as you go to bed, that particular person, you're hanging them over hot acid by their toenails? You ever have those thoughts in your mind? <laughs> Say, yeah, as a matter of fact, I do. Paul says, quit it. Now you're sitting there and you're saying, well, that's easy for Paul to say. No, it really wasn't easy for Paul to say. Because you see, when Paul wrote those words, he was in prison. He was unjustly incarcerated. He had been unfairly treated. As a matter of fact, we know he will, was eventually going to lose his life for doing nothing more than bearing witness to the risen Christ that we're celebrating this Easter Sunday. And yet, when you examine the life of Paul, whether through a microscope or a telescope, you can't find any bitterness, you can't find any rage, you can't find any unforgiveness, you can't find any malice, no unresolved anger, no ill willness in his life at all. And what Paul is basically telling us is this, hey, buddy, let me tell you something. I lost my baggage, you can lose yours. Now, I know you're sitting there and probably saying, wait a minute, I thought this was Easter. It is. Well, isn't this about the resurrection of Christ? It is. Well, then why are you talking about getting rid of your baggage? What in the world does the resurrection of Jesus Christ have to do with getting rid of my baggage? One word answer, everything. It has everything to do with it. As a matter of fact, as you're going to learn at the end of this message, it's the only way you can get rid of your baggage because one of the greatest benefits that comes from a risen Savior is forgiveness. It's because Jesus Christ is alive that we can not only have the experience of forgiveness, we can be forgiven, we can have the enablement of forgiveness, we can forgive. Now, here's the verse I want to, I want to focus in on this morning. Verse 32, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other. Now, you've all heard that before. Y'all are forgiven. Yeah, but now Paul adds something. Just 
as in Christ God forgave you. Whew. You forgive others just as in Christ God forgave you. See, there are three rules of forgiveness in the Bible. This is one of them. I'm going to give you all three right now. There are three rules of forgiveness. The first rule we all know, it's called the golden rule. You should forgive others the way you want others to forgive you. That's the golden rule. God's rule is you will be forgiven the way you forgive others. You remember what Jesus said in the Lord's Prayer? Forgive us our trespasses as we, let's say it together, Forgive those who trespass against us. That's God's rule. God's, way, God's rule is you will be forgiven the way you forgive others. The grace rule is this verse. The way you should forgive others is the way God has forgiven you. Now, let me just go ahead and get all of this out because I'm right there with you. Forgiveness is not easy. It's one of the hardest things you do. It doesn't come naturally. Holding grudges, that's easy. Staying bitter, that's easy. Never ever letting go, that's easy. The hard part is forgiveness. And you're sitting there saying, yeah, you're right, but why is it so hard? Can I tell you why? The Greek word forgive literally means to let go or to send away. It's a financial term, and it refers to the canceling of a debt. See, here's the problem. Whenever somebody does you wrong, they're in your debt. They owe you. They owe you restitution. They owe you confession. They owe you an apology. They owe you an I'm sorry. They owe you, I'll for, will you forgive me? They owe you, I'll never do it again. They owe you, and you know it, and they know it. And the reason why forgiveness is so hard is forgiveness is the willingness on your own to cancel the debt. So here's what happened on Good Friday. God took the biggest debt that's ever been incurred. You think we're running a deficit in this country? You think Greece has got a problem? You think Europe's got a problem? The biggest deficit in the history of the world was the sin deficit. And God took the sins of every person who has ever lived and will ever live. Every bad thought, every bad word, every bad deed. He took every one of them and put them all on Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ paid the debt. No one ever owed a greater debt than we owe to God, and no one will ever forgive a greater debt than God forgave us. And the simple reason why, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ today, the simple reason why you ought to be a forgiving person is because you are a forgiven person. Because only forgiven people are motivated to forgive. Let me tell you something. If you're here this morning and you're saying, I, I just got a hard time forgiving this person. You just don't know what they did to me. One of two things is true about you. Either you've never really experienced the forgiveness that comes through knowing Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, or you really don't understand it. Because if you've ever experienced it and you understand it, you'll be motivated to forgive. Now, again, I know you're sitting there and you're saying, but you don't know how much he hurt me. You don't know what she did to me. Listen, let me, let me just, let me, let me, can I just help you on something? You're going to die bitter. You're going to die in the prison of unforgiveness. You're going to die with unresolved relationships if all you ever do is focus on what that person did to you. If you're ever going to forgive that person, you've got to quit focusing on what that person did to you. You've got to start focusing on what Christ did for you. And once you start focusing on what he did for you, then you get the power and the strength to forgive us for what they did to you. Now, here's the wonderful news. You ready? This is good news. The introduction has been real long. The points are itsy bitsy, teeny weeny short. And all of God's people said, Amen. All right, now watch this. Write down three things. We're going to blow through and going to be done. Ready? Here we go. How are we to forgive other people? How did God forgive us? Number one, we must forgive freely. If you're going to forgive somebody, you've got to forgive them freely. Here's a pop quiz How much did Jesus Christ charge us to die for our sins? How much did he charge us? Nothing. How much did God charge us to send Christ to die for our sins? Nothing. Free of charge. God didn't say, now I'm going to forgive you, James, but I want my pound of flesh first. James, I'm going to forgive you, but before I do, I'm going to have a little bit of revenge. Before I forgive you, you owe me, you're going to pay up. No, here's the way it's going to work, James. First you clean up your life. First you get your act together, then I'll forgive you. That's not the way God forgave. He says, I'm going to forgive you freely. Free of charge. All of grace. See, there are some of you here this morning, and you say, well, I want to forgive. 
It's just that before I forgive the principle of the crime, I want to collect the interest of revenge. And there are some of you who are saying, I'll forgive them when I get my pound of flesh and my quart of blood, then I'll forgive them. Yeah, you let them crawl on broken glass and beg, and I just might do it. <laughs> no, you have to forgive freely. No strings attached, no fine print, no conditions. Number two, told you they were short. Number two, we must forgive fully. You got to forgive fully. Forgiveness is not fractional. What if God woke up? What, what, what if God this morning had, had said to us, you know what? I've decided there's one part of one fraction of one decimal point of one sin I'm not going to forgive that you've done. You know what that means? No more eternal life. No more heaven. No more grace. But God says, no, James, when I forgive you, I forgive you fully. I'm going to forgive all of your sins, plural. I'm going to forgive all of your sin, singular. I'm going to forgive you fully. That's what you've got to do. You cannot forgive fractionally. You've got to forgive fully. You've got to come to a point where you say, I'm not going to deal with this anymore. I'm not going to carry this baggage anymore. I'm not going to carry, I'm not going to leave one big suitcase to carry a little one with me. I'm leaving it all behind. I've got to forgive fully. And then number three, we must forgive finally. And what I mean by that is this. When you decide to cancel a debt, you don't bring it up anymore. It's over. You never collect on that debt again. That's why the Bible says this in Jeremiah 31, 34. Listen to this. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity. We all know that. But listen to this next part. Listen, I love this. And I will remember their sin no more. <laughs> that simply means God doesn't hold grudges. He never throws the sin back at our face. He wipes the slate clean. He wipes it clean for one reason and one reason only, because Jesus died on the cross and because Jesus came back from the dead. So I want to close with this. All right, everybody, buckle your seatbelt. I'm going to tell you the most fascinating conversation I've ever had in my life, ever. Now, you would think, you know, I've been in the Oval Office with the President of the United States. I've been in Dr. Billy Graham's home, and I'm not saying that to throw names around. I'm just saying, you know, I've had some pretty fascinating conversations. Nothing even approaches this conversation. I was flying to Syracuse, New York about five weeks ago, and I got on one of these little commuter jets, about 70 people. And, and normally when I get on an airplane, I always pray for the person that's going to be sitting next to me. I don't know who that's going to be. But I usually will say, Lord, would you put somebody on the airplane next to me that would be open to the gospel, somebody I could talk to about Jesus. I'm going to be real honest. Five weeks ago, I, have, I've got, I had a book deadline. I'm working on another book, and I had a book deadline. I needed to get through another sermon and prepare another sermon, so I stayed three or four weeks ahead. I got behind, gotten behind on my email. I had two books I was trying to finish up. I had a ton of stuff I wanted to do. And so driving to the airport, I said, Lord, just today, this is my prayer. Here's who I want sitting next to me. Nobody. <laughs> Please let me have an empty seat so I can have two and a half hours of just peace and quiet. Plane fills up. Sure enough, there's one empty seat on that plane, and it's my seat next to me. And I mean, God is good all the time, right? <laughs> They're about to shut the door, and one last guy runs on. He's a soldier in the Army, and he sits down next to me. I'm going to call him John. We call all these fictional people John, so this is John. We start talking, and uh, I asked John, you know, where are, you, are you from Syracuse? Yeah, he says, I, I'm going up to New York. What are you going up to New York for? He said, well, I'm going to see my girlfriend. We have a little two-year-old boy, and I'm about to ship out to Afghanistan for 10 months, and so I'm, I'm on a couple of days leave before I go back and ship out to Afghanistan. And I said, oh, okay. And, and then he said, uh, what do you do for a living? And I always love when people ask me that question. You know, I, I used to be kind of cute about it. You know, well, I, I, I'm in sales. You know, I used to do that. And, and then sometimes, you know, I, I, I'm an ambassador because the Bible says I'm an ambassador for Christ. So that, you know, I'm, I'm an amb you know, kind of get cute. And I just forget it. I'm a pastor. So, so what do you know? I'm a pastor. And then I just always follow up with that question. Whenever I say I'm a pastor, I'm going to say, you know, I said, John, where are you on your spiritual journey? He said, well, I don't believe in God. I don't believe in the Bible, just like that. I said, really? I said, do you mind telling me your story? He said, you really want to hear it? I said, sure. And then the ride really began. He said, well, my dad committed suicide when I was three years old. 
I was raised by a mom who verbally and physically abused me. And all my life as a child, all she did was look, was look for a reason to kick my blank. He said, when I turned 18, I got a girl pregnant. We had a little girl. Didn't know how to support her. I quit high school, couldn't get a job. So I joined the Army. Met another girl. Got her pregnant. We now have a two-year-old son. He said, you still want to hear my story? I said, sure. He said, when I was nine, year old, nine years old, my mom had to go to work, and she left me with a 13-year-old friend of mine because his mom was at home and she could babysit. We went down to the rec center to, to play, and, and I got hungry, so I told him I was going back to his house to eat a sandwich. I left him at the rec center. While I was gone, a mother allowed her four-year-old son to walk down to the rec center which is just three blocks away. She watched him the whole way and watched till he crossed the street. She went back in the house with his baby sister. As he was crossing the street, the 13-year-old kid came out, saw this four-year-old kid, lures him into the woods, and proceeds to sexually molest the four-year-old and then kills him with a rock. He said, I walked up just in time to see all of that happen. I saw that 13-year-old boy sexually molest and kill that four-year-old boy. And I was frozen with fear. He said, the 13-year-old boy saw me after, after he'd done all he'd done, and he ran over to me and grabbed me by the collar and said, if you ever tell anybody, I'll kill you too. So he said, for three days, I couldn't sleep. I couldn't eat. I had nightmares. I was afraid that boy would find me or see me or come in through my bedroom window and kill me too. The police found the body of that four-year-old boy and evidently the 13-year-old figured that they'd eventually find him out. So three days later, he confesses to the crime. It was all over the, the national news. It happened over 20 years ago. He said when, they, when he confessed, it came out that I'd witnessed the murder. So now I'm the star witness for the prosecution. So he said, Pastor, I've got to get on that witness stand before all these people I grew up with in town, and I have to tell that gruesome story, every single detail, all over again. He said, that's been 20 years ago, and he said, I go to bed at night, and I see that four-year-old boy, and I wake up in the morning, and I see that four-year-old boy, and I go eat lunch, and I see that four-year-old boy, and I've lived with it for 20 years. He said, you still want to hear my story? And I got tears down my eyes, and I said, Sure. He said, I didn't tell you, I'm a mixed martial arts expert. Matter of fact, he said, I'm the, I, I won the cha Army Championship about two years ago. I said, what kind of martial arts do you do? And he told me, and I said, wow. He said, he said yeah. He said, matter of fact, he said, you ever heard of the Brazilian chokehold? I said, I never heard of that. He said, man, it's the coolest thing. He said, you can crush a man's windpipe in about eight seconds. I said, really? He said, yeah, you want to show it to you? I said, no, 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 that's okay. No, 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 no. He said, you know, you know how I got to the finals of the championship? He said, I fought a guy that was 6 feet 10, weighed 295 pounds. He said, I put him in that choke code. He said, he was unconscious in about six seconds. And then he looked at me as cold as any human beings ever looked at me and said, I'm a killing machine. And then he said, you still want to hear my story? I said, Sure. He said, a month ago, my girlfriend called me and said, I I've got a problem. He said, what's the problem? So it's our two-year-old son. I've got to leave him with somebody. I'm a, she was a waitress. I've got to go to work. And there's nobody to keep him. He said, ask my mom. Your mom's out of town. Well, ask your mom. No, she's got to work. He said, well, then quit your job. We'll find you another job. Just don't leave him with just anybody. She said, I'll take care of it. She calls him back in a little while. She says, look, I'm going to leave him with my girlfriend. She's cool. She's good. She'll take good care of him. Well, the problem was she lied. She didn't leave him with a girlfriend. She left him with a girlfriend's boyfriend who proceeds to sexually molest the two-year-old. She calls him hysterical to tell him what happened. So now he's dealing with a lying girlfriend and his two-year-old son who's been sexually molested. And he says, I think when I get to Syracuse, I'm going to look this guy up and I'm going to crush his windpipe. I said, son, you really don't want to do that. I said, what good would it do your two kids? You kill this guy. You're never going to see your daughter again. You're not going to see your son again. 
He said, I know you're right. And he said, I'll tell you something else that bothers me. He says, you know, I'm going off to Afghanistan for 10 months, and I swore that I'd never, ever be away from my kids like my dad left me, and I didn't want to leave my kids. And I said, well, why don't you go to your commanding officer and tell him your situation? I'm sure they'll let you out of your tour of duty. Maybe you can minister to your family. So, oh, you don't understand. I volunteered to go, and I want to go. I said, why do you want to go to Afghanistan? He said, I'm a machine gunner. And I have volunteered to be a machine gunner on top of one of these armored personnel carriers because that's where you get the most combat. And I said, why do you want to go to combat? And I am, I'm, I'm not kidding you, with no feeling in his eyes, he looked at me and said, I've got to kill somebody. He said, my commanding officer and my company psychiatrist met with me yesterday, and they're really worried about me. They said, you, you can't handle life on the outside. They said, you're the kind of guy that could just go, just kill somebody, just walk into a post office or whatever. And then the tears came into this soldier's eyes, and he looked at me, and he said, my life has just been Plain blank. And he stared out the window. And he's looking out the window with tears in his eyes, and I'm looking up to heaven with tears in my eyes, and I'm going, oh, God, what do I say to this soldier? Because when I got on that plane and he got on that plane, I had thought about saying, you know, John, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. And I thought, that probably is not the coolest thing to say right now. And I said, oh, God, I don't know what to tell him. His life is 180 degrees different from the life that I've had. I can't, even, I can't even relate to what this kid's gone through. God, help me to say something. And, boy, it hit me. And I put my arm on his shoulder, and I said, John, can I just speak a word into your life as a pastor? He said, Sure. I said, if you don't get rid of this rage and this anger and this bitterness you're living with right now, you're either going to do something you're going to regret the rest of your life, or you're going to live a bitter, unhappy, miserable life that's going to follow you all the way to the grave. He said, well, Pastor, do you have a solution? I said, I don't have a solution. I've got the solution. He said, well, what would that be? I said, you're not going to believe me when I tell you, but I said, it's the risen Christ. That's the only shot you got. He said, you're telling me a resurrected Jesus Christ is my only hope. I said, yes. As a matter of fact, I said, it even, I, I know it even works. He said, how do you know? I said, real easy. I said, you don't believe in God. He said, no, I don't believe in God. I said, but you don't hate Christians. He said, no, I don't hate Christians. I said, well, there was a man in the Bible who believed in God, but he hated Christians. As a matter of fact, he made it his full-time job to kill Christians. He made it his full-time job to wipe out Christians everywhere that he went. He said, what happened to him? I said, he met the risen Jesus. He said, what happened to him then? I said, his hatred was replaced with love. And all of his grudges were replaced with grace. And all of his malice was replaced with mercy. And I said, John, what happened to him can happen to you. And what God did for him, God can do for you. We landed, and there was a guy sitting in the seat in front of us, two guys, and I don't know how this guy heard me speak. I'm such a soft-spoken person. I don't know how he heard me. <laughs> but as the plane's coming into a landing, this guy looked, turned around, and he looked at John, and he said, this guy told you the truth. Jesus is the answer to your problem. We got off the plane, and I did something I'm sure no man's ever done in John's life. I put my arm around John. I said, John, I'm sorry that your dad committed suicide, and I'm sorry that your mom was so abusive. And I'm sorry that you witnessed the murder of that four-year-old boy, and I'm sorry about what happened to your two-year-old son. And I'm sorry you've gotten yourself in such a financial condition with these kids. I I'm really sorry for all that. But I said, John, God has used all that to put you on a seat next to me for one reason. He wants you to know Jesus. I sent him a Bible. I've sent him one of my books. 
We've corresponded by email, but I've never gotten that kid out of my mind. I'm going to close with this. I got my luggage, and I walked over, and I hugged his neck, which I'm sure no man's ever done. I said, John, I want you to know I love you. Thank for letting me share, and I'll be talking to you, and I'll be emailing you. And I don't think a day's gone by in five weeks I hadn't thought about that soldier. And as I walked and got in the car to go to my speaking engagement, I thought to myself, I wonder how John's going to die. I don't mean he's going to get a bullet in the head or a knife or heart attack. I don't mean that. I wonder if he's going to die with all this baggage. I wonder if he's going to die with all this bitterness and all this unresolved anger. And I wonder if he's going to die ticked off at somebody because of what somebody did to him. And then I thought I'd just share this with you and then we'll be done. I just want to ask all of you in this room a question. How are you going to die? You're going to die with all that baggage? You're going to die with all that anger and all that bitterness and all that unresolved stuff you've been carrying around? Is that the hell you're going to die? I know how I'm going to die. You say, no, you don't. Oh, yeah, I do. I know exactly how I'm going to die. I'm going to die forgiven. And I have learned through Jesus Christ, the Easter Jesus we came to worship today, when you get forgiven, you can then be forgiving. Is there something that has happened to you that just seems impossible to forget, impossible to forgive? Does the pain or anger of that event affect your day-to-day life? Don't waste another moment in misery. Call Touching Lives today at 1-800-413-1131. We want to pray with you and help you find the peace that comes through forgiveness. Holding a grudge makes for a great deal of excess baggage in your life. Maybe you've even tried to forgive someone who has wronged you, but that bitterness keeps eating away at you no matter how hard you've tried. There is a way to truly forgive someone. The Bible shows us how to give the gift of forgiveness once and for all. Learn how to step out from under the weight of unforgiveness with the series Lost Baggage. Order your copy today. CDs $25, DVDs $45 at touchinglives.org or call 1-800-413-1131. Now, a look at the next Touching Lives. If you've made yourself miserable and unhappy, and some of you have, because you've gone through life being hypercritical, hypocritical, negative, self-righteous, holier than thou, can I tell you what you need to do right now? Drop the baggage. Get off the holier than thou train. Quit looking down on the unbeliever who acts like an unbeliever. Forgiveness doesn't come naturally because it's not always an easy thing to do. We have to learn how to give the gift of forgiveness just as we learned how to receive it from God. Because of the faithful prayers and support of our donors, Touching Lives is able to share the healing message of forgiveness to a world that desperately needs to hear it. Thank you.